conversation this morning going from what you have seen that promise that the federal government made that by December this year the Port Harcourt refinery will be in action will be active the Warrior refinery will work on it will begin by uh, next year and by the end of 2024 Nigeria will be a next next net exporter of petroleum products how feasible you want to uh, stick with us this morning as we have a conversation with our next guest who is a former managing director of the Wari and uh, beg your pardon, Port Harcourt and Kaduna Refineries, uh, Engineer Alex Ogilibi. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Let's begin with that's what we just heard, you know, the, um, the GMD of the NNPC say, giving assurances over and over again that the Port Harcourt refinery will be delivered before the end of this year, latest by December 31. And we're trying to hold government to their word. But ex some other experts are raising other issues about uh, what exactly the federal government would be delivering at the end of this year. So tell us, do you think it is feasible what the GMD of the NNPCL is saying? That is the GCU, beg your pardon, of the NNPCL is saying, that's military, that the Port Harcourt refinery will be completed before the end of this year. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me first explain who I'm representing here. I'm not representing myself. I'm a past president of the Nigerian Society of Chemical Engineers, and we are very interested in what's going on, mm. and uh, we feel that we have a contribution to make to the national discourse on this issue. Um, that's one, and um, I will take this issue very seriously because we also tried two months ago, 5th of October, we were in, in Port Harcourt having our fellows conference there. And we had tried to make a visit to the refinery just to give them some support and to see what's going on there and see if we can make some contributions. On that team, there were at least three past MDs of that refinery, including myself and some younger ones who have also passed through the refinery. So we were doing it in good faith and trying to help as a, as a professional society. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so also here to share, to join you in, uh, can I say, educating and informing the public. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we know that, for that reason also, we wish, I wish, that this country will produce petrol, especially petrol and diesel, enough for our consumption. Um, as I indicated once or twice, in 1991, we were completely um, dependent on a local. There was no import at all of all these products. The three refineries, Wari, Port Harcourt, and Kaduna, were working fairly close to 70, 80% throughput. Unfortunately, all those refineries are sh shut down now. I don't want to go into that. But let's go to Port Harcourt Refinery. I want the question you raised. Just, just a moment, so that people can appreciate what yes. you're talking about. Yes. You said at some point that our refineries were operating at 70%, all of them put together. Minimum. Minimum 70%. Yes. I also understand that Collectively now, sorry, are you collectively or one refinery operating at 70%? All three were operating minimum of 70%. Was there ever a time any one of them operated at, at 100 percent? Yes, Potaco Refinery operated at 100 percent in De uh, December 1992. I was, I was MD. With a refining capacity of? 150,000 barrels per day. I recall that because my, my chairman at the time, uh, Chief Feide, had called me and said, I hear that you are running refining at 100 percent. I said, yeah, we can go 110. And that's the design is 100%, but you can push it if you need to. And we were doing that at that time because we were, we were planning for a turnaround maintenance. So we had to store PMS, petrol, for, to last us the 30 days planned for turnaround. So I was running the fire at 100%, and we had 50 million liters of PMS in storage, which we distributed for the whole month. Nobody knew we were shut down. But that was Portaco Refinery. This same Portaco Refinery. This was which year, sir? 1991. 1991. Yes. So from your experience, sir, what can you tell us about the capacity of these refineries and the potential for the turnaround that the federal government is currently embarking upon? 
Uh, is what they're telling us feasible? Can these refineries actually come back on stream at 100% or at whatever percentage, you know, perhaps uh, average or above average? As an engineer, I'm yes. going to answer your question properly. Five, ten years ago, if I was told that we, we had a plan, a proper plan to get those refineries from zero, which they are now, to 100%, I would believe it. But if you see the depth of damage that has happened, especially the refineries, none of them have worked for five years, since 2017-18. Now, the Port Harcourt, let's come back to, so the issue is not can it be done. There are many issues there. Who is going to do it? How much is it going to cost? There's a benefit uh, uh, cost analysis. So all of these issues come in. Theoretically, it can be done, just like what you are going to be seeing in Portaco Refinery now. Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question. It can be done, theoretically, but is it feasible in, uh, commercially and uh, everything else? So should we keep our hopes off okay. for December for the Port Harcourt refinery? I will, I, will, I will address that in a minute. Um, Port Harcourt refinery, the last time I was there was 2012 when I was on the NNPC, uh, Federal Government Committee. At that time, the refinery was operating about 50%, and it was barely operating. The old Portaco refinery has not operated for 40 years, at least since 1990. Now, sorry, that's 30 years. That's the, sorry, that's 30, 30 years. years. The old refinery, the 60,000 <laughs> barrels, the one was built 60 years ago. No, it was built in 1965. Okay, 35 plus 23, 58. That refinery has not operated. Since 1990, when the new refinery came on, so it's been shut down. But let me go back one stage. When the new refinery was designed, I was project manager throughout from '85 to '90. To 90. We had accommodated the old refinery in the design of the new one. We linked them. We took what we could use in the old refinery, the 60,000 barrels per day, to feed into the new one. The new one is a more, com more complex. How is it more complex? If you put one barrel of crude oil into the new one, 48, 50% of it will be petrol, PMS. The old refinery, if you put one barrel of crude oil into it, you only get maximum 23-24% of petrol. Shows the complexity. The old refinery has just one conversion unit that can produce petrol. The new refinery had four different conversion units. That's this one that is being rehabilitated? No. That is the issue. Why is this old refinery being re rehabilitated instead of the, of the new one? Pause. That Are you yes. saying that the one that the federal government is working on right now is the old refinery? Is the old refinery was built in 1965 with different old technology. Now, what is being done there, again, from the, uh, from the um, uh, visual presented by the MD, you probably have a tax of in the last few days, is that they are reconstructing, they are, that is a better word than rehabilitation. When you rehabilitate, equipment is there, you repair it, you rejig it, but when you are reconstructing, you, every pipe is removed and you put a new one. He mentioned that refineries can be 100 years old. Yes, if you go, I have seen refineries over 100 years old, but when you go there, you will see different units. The one that was 100 years old is no longer used. Next to it are the newer ones. You do not reconstruct 100 or 50 year old refineries. You put new ones there with newer technology and it is more difficult what they are doing now than what, what, they, what they shall be done. So, so how do you explain the millions of dollars that has been spent on the refineries for turnaround maintenance over the years and yet we have, we have had no result up until now that we speak? 
If I try to explain, it would take me at least an hour. There is a report written by a committee set up by the federal government in 2012. We spent three months going through all the refineries to evaluate what's wrong and everything. There is no way we can justify the situation we have today. The refineries were built, the, the three refineries, Wari, Kaduna, and Port Harcourt, were built according to international standards. They were all tested and for completion and they performed at the time they were completed. They ran according to the, uh, the design for many years. However, being a government-owned facility, not a private one, they were not run commercially. What does that mean? Monies did not come in time for maintenance. Not enough money actually was given for maintenance. And it was not a profit organized, you know, project. So it was just declining slowly because of lack of maintenance until it crashed. All of them crashed by 2018. Are you suggesting that money was budgeted for, but not in all cases was money released? Correct. You just summarize it for me. When I was MD of Cardinal Refinery or even Port Harcourt, we will budget to the, to the corporate headquarters. Our budget will be there. Every month, we will receive between 50 and 60 percent of our budget. You are supposed to make up the rest yourself somehow. And how were you expected to do that? Well, you have to be imaginative. When I was in Kaduna Refinery, for instance, it was the only refinery that had a tin and, tin and drum manufacturing plant, which is not typically a refinery thing. But we had that plant because we were producing uh, uh, kerosene and we were selling it in tins. So I was selling ordinary tins and drums to people who were buying them for water and other uses to augment the budget as, uh, for the refinery. Let, let, let's, so, let's get some practical. Sorry, we'll call yes. that. Yeah. Um, so the refinery, the Port Harcourt refinery that the federal government is promising yes. to deliver by the end of this year yes. is the more complex one, is that what No, is the, 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 the oldest the, and what we call hydro scheming. Col it does not have all the facilities and the, the processes that the newer one has. Okay. So what, um, what would you have, what's the capacity of this old refinery we're talking about? 60,000 barrels per day. The, the other half of the refinery, the newer one, which was built 30 years later, is 150,000 barrels per day. In, you, in the same space? The same, next to each other. Next to each other. I told you a few minutes ago, we had, in the design of the new one, we accommodated, we brought, we, we, we incorporated it. Mm. And my first reaction when I heard about this repair was why are they trying to separate the old one that is uh, 58 years old from the new one? So what do you think could be the reason? I will guess. First of all, they wanted to do a, a quick fix, fix politically. It, I'm just guessing. Secondly, Dangote refinery has been on, project has been on for a long time. All the governments before the, that were there since 2014 when Dangote started, we well, have been hoping that Dangote refinery will come on stream and relieve them of the pressure of the old refineries. So towards the end, I'm saying within the last two years, mm. when this rehabilitation was started or was, was conceived, they preferred to do the old ones quickly and say, well, we can, somebody told them they could fix it quickly and produce. That is wrong. I say it is wrong because the original contractor <laughs> of the new Portaco refinery refused to participate in this rehabilitation process. And why I, is that? I'm still because interested in... they did not think it was the right way to go. Can we go back to the, to the issue of funding? Um, you have suggested that money was... Um, budgeted for, but not in all cases was money released. That's so, for operations. For operations yes. and for maintenance, I imagine. Uh, of course, uh, for maintenance. Yes. So, who should we begin to ask questions about the uh, measure, the amount of money that was not released, that ought to have been released for maintenance? Who should you ask? Corporate headquarters of the NNPC. NNPC. Because the, all the refineries. Were, sub, were you know uh, subsidiaries of the of the NNPC corporate, 
and uh, the corporate telcos are released money to them. In fact, as you know, the refineries, and I said they're not commercial, when the refineries in the NMPC produce the products, they don't sell. They give it to PM, PPMC, the marketing arm. So they don't see money. They only see product going out and NMPC uh, 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 marketing and corporate record collecting the money. In 1990, we generated products. We were running at about average of 95, 96% throughput in the refineries in Port Harcourt combined, old and new. And in the 90s, when you were managing director that you're talking about, we still had issues of fuel scarcity, despite the fact that no, there was minimal production. No, no. I just told you, in 1991, this country was in completely self-reliant in products. We did not import any PMS in 1991. The records are there to check. You also said at some point that we exported petroleum products. Yes, during that same period. Mm -hmm. Because Port Harcourt refinery was able to export because we had a, a, a jetty that can take out 30,000 tons of products. Yeah. Worry cannot take out anything because it's only 5,000 uh, 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 capacity to take out, 5,000 tons mm -hmm. because of the bar, yeah. extra gross bar. Of course, Kaduna is inland. Maybe they export Ill illegally through to Niger and other parts of, uh, of the north. Okay, the, the issue here now is the federal government has made a promise. Yes. The issues that Karadia, my, 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 my colleague here, Bukola, is asking is, if things weren't so bad over the years, yes. was, the, was to say that this one will not go the same way if we don't address the issues. We'll get to that one, but the question of whether or not the federal government can deliver at the end of this year is still remaining. Yeah, okay, let me try to answer, answer that. Uh, until I see, no, go back to one stage. Federal government keeps talking and pushing things out. Why can't we listen to the contractor? It's only the contractor that can tell you whether it's going to finish that work end of this month. That work is not being done by protocol refinery management. It's been done by a contractor. They awarded the contract of $1.5 billion three years ago, or two and a half years ago. So the first person when you are in doubt is to ask the contractor to speak. Let us see a report of the contractors. We haven't seen that. If we had the opportunity, as I told you in October, to go there, I could answer some of your questions in more detail. But I'm, I'm, I'm only using the fact of the uh, video clip released two days ago. Now, let's go back to that. I told you, from what I've seen there, it is a reconstruction of an old refinery. It is not just rehabilitation. They're putting in new equipment, and uh, all the pipe pipes, the old ones are being replaced. And the capacity will remain the same. And the capacity has to remain the same because they have not expanded it. Okay. Just now, a quick one. Yes, okay. hold on. One of the concerns that I have is that unlike what we did in 1985 to 1989, when we uh, combined the old and the new, we combined all the, the, the different pipes and uh, systems to make it one refinery of 210,000 uh, barrels per day. That was the, the capacity. Now, the, this process is to extract extra, extra, the 60,000 alone. So that's a problem. Okay. Just a quick one before we yes. go to Abuja. My colleagues also have questions for you. Yes. Uh, there is also this vexed issue of modular refineries. The, the government at, uh, at some point decided that, look, while we're waiting for these big refineries, the Port Harcourt, Wari, and Kaduna to come on stream, uh, can we have modular refineries produce products for, for the country, PMS, diesel, AGO, Jet A1, and all of that? Uh, and then just yesterday we saw a report that says that a good number of those uh, uh, licenses are still lying fallow, dormant. Yes. What, what do you think is responsible for that? Well, these licenses were awarded on a different basis completely, not to produce those products. Really? That's correct. Because even the four or five that have been completed out of the 59 in that publication, not a single one of them produce those five products. What are the five products standard in the refinery? LPG, kerosene, petrol, diesel, and fuel oil. Those are the five standard products. All these modular refineries will only produce maximum 
part of this. The only one they produce in any appreciable uh, quantity that can be used locally is diesel. And the history is that all, most of the, one, the ones that are producing did not start to produce for the public. They started to use the diesel for their own consumption because they produce crude oil. And they could not get diesel for their machines at cheap rates. So they said, I have crude oil. Let me put a small unit modular refining here, make some diesel for myself. If I have any extra, I sell to the public. That's what Aradel did, Niger Delta. That was the first one done by Chief Adams, who was a past MD of NNPC. So all the modular refineries you see today produce, let me tell you what they produce. They produce, at best, with the five of them, at best, some kerosene. And when I say some kerosene, I mean one truck a day. They produce um, NAFTA. And the, NAFTA is a very important so, um, intermediate product in producing petrol. NAFTA by itself cannot be put in a car to run because the, the, it, it, will, it will knock. So NAFTA is a feedstock for petrochemical plants. Europe is short of NAFTA. So all these modular refineries are producing NAFTA from our crude oil and collecting that NAFTA and exporting it for profit. And maybe a little bit of NAFTA for your plastic industry in Nigeria. Why not produce petrol from them? They do not have the units. The capacity. No, not capacity. The units. A refinery is made up of several units. I just told you. None of them has the same unit as the old refinery. So why is the NMDPRA, I believe that's the issuing authority for licenses, issuing licenses for these products rather than what we need at home for domestic consumption? Good question. There's, no, there's absolutely no reason for that. And the way they have, they have hoodwinked in the past is that in the, 20 years ago, those, most of those 40 refinery uh, licenses were given on the basis that we want to build a refinery, okay? But we, we, we need some money. We, we need, it's a big investment. Give us crude oil, give my company crude oil to export. But I have to prove to you that I want to build a refinery. I'll do a feasibility study, one small feasibility study, which says blah, 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 blah. And on the basis of that, they are giving the license, they are giving some crude allocation, they export, and never build a refinery. Oh dear. Hmm. Well, some of them, when they now build a small refinery, it's only to make NAFTA and diesel. Just to export. Just okay. to export. Okay. Abuja wants to come in now. Go ahead, guys. Okay, uh, Chairman, you're going to ask a question. Yeah, um, uh, Mr. Gadebe, good morning and good to see you. So, uh, first on this modular refinery question, because there was a, a gentleman who was on one of our sister programs, and he spoke about the viability of modular refineries, and the ED of NCDMB, Engineer Obote, has spoken up, saying, well, they are indeed viable. He went on and spoke about Walter Smith, how much they paid the dividend, and the equity stake that they do have. Now, concerning whether or not modular refineries can produce petrol. As presently as it stands, you've talked about, yes, they can come up with NAFTA, they can come up with diesel, but they don't have the, uh, I think you spoke about, a certain component to produce petrol. Now, what is it that they need to do to produce petrol? Well, you started by talking about viability. For the private investor, if they can make profit with what they have, they are satisfied with that by exporting NAFTA and uh, fuel oil. They, it makes their project viable for them, but they are not satisfying the requirements of the country. So if the modular refineries must produce petrol, they must have a platform, a reforming unit, a fluid catalytic cracking unit, hydro cracking unit, all of these are in the Dangote refinery, most of it are in the NMPC refineries that are not working. So not a single modular refinery 
has a, a, a reforming unit. Without a reforming unit, you cannot, you cannot produce petrol. Even the new, even the, the NNPC uh, project going on in Port Harcourt now, the petrol they are going to produce there, if we are going to use the old plant as it was, they will need lead to increase the, the, the run, the, uh, the, what we call the run, to 91 to make the products. They cannot make the specifications without using lead. And lead has been banned in this country and many parts of the world as a, an ingredient for petrol. So you can see why I was talking earlier on to say that the old refinery should, the new refinery should have been rehabilitated before the old one. Because that's where they can make the products and make them in a commercial way. 20%, 25% of, of uh, petrol on crude is not viable anymore. Not to talk about not making the, the correct specifications. That refinery was built 60 years ago for a different uh, um, specification of products. They have improved new technology to, to, to reduce air pollution, water pollution. If you look on CNN every day and see the, 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 um, the weather forecast, Lagos has number five, worst air pollution on, the, on, on, on that program. Every day, Kaduna, uh, Abuja has four. And it's all the result of the pollution coming from the Niger Delta and from Lagos, from all our, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, um, generators. That's the problem with pollution. So if I could ask you, from the information you have, about what is going on at the moment with the rehabilitation of Portaco refinery. Can we meet the target? Or what do you see playing out by the end of this year in terms of it coming back on stream? Let me continue to predict. I have not been there. We tried to be there on the 5th of October. We plan to go there as, a, as, a, as a, uh, chemical engineers. One hour before we were supposed to go there, the, our visit was canceled. We could not visit the place. So I cannot tell you for sure. I can only talk on the basis of what I've seen. What they are doing there now, let me, okay, let me predict. If, if what, the, what I hear from that short nine-minute uh, uh, release by the, minute, by the uh, MD of the refinery, at best, they will have some kind of mechanical completion by the end of, of December because he said they are... 75% done overall, or but 98% done on procurement and some other issues. But by the end of December, at best, they will have mechanical completion. Then they will do testing of, a, of, the, of each equipment and systems. You test one equipment, you see how this, it fits with another one, then you, you put everything together as a system. The system test may take, I don't know, anything for two, two weeks or one month, before you can start, in my opinion, based on what is seen, I have not been there. I don't think it can be done more than, uh, within two or three months. Now, what you will get there again is a, like the old refinery of 60 years ago with just new equipment. The capacity is still 60,000 barrels per day. It will produce less than 30% of the new refinery in Port Harcourt. Less than, in fact, I would say about maybe... Yeah, but, 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 but I thought they said that if refineries are built in modules, it can, it can go from 1,000 barrels per day to 100,000 barrels per day. If they are built in modules, they can expand that way. Is that right? That's correct. But when you say modules, modules are what? Process units. I just mentioned to you, certain units must be there. A reformer, um, fluid catalytic cracker or hydrocracker. These units, these important units, are what they call the conversion units to convert the crude oil to the finished products in an, you know, uh, you know very, should I say, uh, best uh, scenario. I give you the example. The old refinery that is being repaired now 
cannot produce more than 25% maximum on crude oil. In other words, one barrel of crude will produce maximum of 25% uh, of, of petrol. Whereas, Potaco refining, the, old, the new one, which is uh, next door to the old one they are repairing, can produce up to 48 or 50 percent on crude oil. You put one barrel of crude oil, half of it is producing petrol. This one now is, you put on crude oil, only one quarter of it is producing petrol, and it is a smaller, smaller capacity. So overall, I don't expect any appreciable contribution. That is even if all the systems work. I don't have, a, I don't have confidence in that right now, to be frank with you, from what I've seen. If I was, so if I visited the plant, if I may come in here, yes, please. So, so this matter of the refineries, let's look at uh, the the outcome or the byproducts that are supposed to come from all of this refining that we have. One would think that, I mean, if we say going by the cost of um, crude oil right now, say eighty dollars per barrel, the byproducts that come from that refining could give us almost. Uh, almost 100% profit, over 100% profit from the byproducts that come from refining this product. Now, if the authorities and those that know, and you're one of those that know, know that there are byproducts that can fetch the economy more income or that can fetch the country more revenue, shouldn't we be rushing to fix our refineries as they should so that it can give us what we need? I mean, you, were, you managed the refinery when it was running at 100%, and you said you could push it to 110. Shouldn't we be pushing for this? Look, let me, let me remind you, when you are talking about byproducts, I don't really know what you mean. I just gave you that a refinery that takes crude oil to refine it has five standard products. And that is if you have all the conversion units in place. All our modular refineries have only one uh, topping unit. They don't have conversion units. That's why they cannot make PMS or petrol. Is that clear? Now, let's go to the new portal. I don't understand. I don't understand you. Okay, so let's step back a bit. Yes. What byproducts beyond the PMS and fuel and diesel? I mean, beyond the PMS and diesel and NAFTA, what other byproducts come from refining? None. Zero. A refinery produces only those five, and they use fuel from those five to run itself. No other products are produced in the refinery. So at the end? In a standard refinery, I'm not talking of, uh, I'm not talking of uh, modular refineries. Okay, let me clear one issue. When you call a, ref a refinery modular, it means instead of building it from the ground, you build modules and you transport it to the location. That's the only, modular is the de definition of construction method. Mm not the refinery configuration. Perhaps what my colleague is talking about is the petrochemical products that are supposed to come out of it. Aha! Uh -huh. Petrochemical, in a refinery, there are some refineries which are, they are called petrochemical refineries, okay. where you manufacture part of the crude oil, where I say, you, you, part of the food, and you produce naphtha. Okay? Naphtha is a component from a refining process that can be as I told you, can be sent to a petrochemical uh, refinery for, as feedstock. But in a normal refinery, that NAFTA is processed further in a, in a unit, a, re, a conversion unit, which we call reformer. It reforms the NAFTA into PMS. And the PMS that comes from that is almost 90%. Well, you know, so many issues to raise with you now. Absolutely, but, uh, I am. So <laughs> yes. many to unpack. We just got to have to... We gotta, I am to trying not to... Uh, sound technical. Well, not too technical. I'm also trying not to uh, imagine what the other people who are doing the work are, are thinking. Mm -hmm. But I told you clearly that the work they are doing in Portaco Refinery today should have been done on the new part, not the old refinery. Okay. Uh, let's that's just another hope. question. Absolutely. Why would they Altogether. make that choice? Yeah. You know? well, let, let's just hope that maybe, uh, maybe being the former managing director of the Port Harcourt Refinery, maybe you get a call to come assist one way or the other in all of these things. I know you're not looking for political appointment. Huh? No, so, I'm not really that. Your we, expertise we, will, will, will The Society of Chemical Engineers offered, okay. we offered to go there on the 6th of October two months ago, mm. to go and see what is being done there and give some 
So professional advice. Advice. Let's hope that there were three yeah. past MDs of the Portaco refinery in yeah. that group. Mm. But we didn't have that opportunity. Let's hope that this time around you will get that opportunity. Engineer Alex Ogilegbe is former managing director of the Port Harcourt and Kaduna Refineries. He's also a former GED of the NNPC. Thank you so much for your time this morning. You're welcome. Truly really appreciate it. Well, some of your own contribution to the program this morning. Let's begin with yours, Shom Ayuba Dang, who says the federal government should put in financial and human resources 100% for these refineries to deliver to the expectations of Nigerians because Nigeria cannot wait to see these refineries work. It has taken a long time. Indeed, it has. And uh, George Akpambo says, the Kaduna tragedy is one too many and people should be held accountable for such things things if we're ever serious to get things right. May the souls of the victims rest in peace. Nyota. one from Johnson Agogo, and it's an email. He says, I have watched with dismay how fake drugs outlets have increased in the country in recent times. For instance, these days you find both in your urban cities and rural communities fake drug outlets being owned and managed by unregistered nurses and other so-called medical professionals, which has caused untold hardship and danger to unsuspecting Nigerians. The authority concerned should take action to stop the trend. And then Pastor Law Alpha says, sponsoring as many as 400 delegates for COP28 in the midst of this harsh economic realities cannot be justified on the altar of qualifying to host future conferences of this nature. The political class should understand the level of suffering. And we also did see your message, Engineer Wabote. He says that um, contrary to what was said over the weekend, he never said that uh, uh, modular refineries are currently producing PMS. He says that, yes, those modules and capacities have got to be built before they can be produced and that they are viable and are producing. So we, we get all of that. Well, there you go. That is the show today. We do thank you all for your messages. We'll see you again next time. I'm Chamberlain Asof. Goodbye. And I'm Neil Taibbi. Bye-bye. I'm Bukola Koka. Thank you for watching. And I'm Ayamakide. Have a productive day.